Okay, here we go. Here we go. Take two. Okay, now can you see a big tapir and kitty? Yeah. Yes? Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so there's me. I'm Andy uh, next to an agouti. There's Kitty next to a cape here. Uh, we run this thing called Digital Naturalism Laboratories, and we're here in Gamboa, Panama, which is a fun, jungly place uh, that's filled with a bunch of fun scientists. And in general, we try to do art and technology uh, for interacting with nature. Um, we try to do this in the wild or close to the wild or within a lot of context of the wild. Basically, we try to build stuff where we're going to use stuff. That's kind of our, our goal. We have a tiny little house here that we've turned into a construction shop with, you know, lasers and prototyping workshops and goos and electronics and a little, I'm in the, the art science gallery before uh, uh, COVID kind of stopped us from having indoor events. Um, and we also do a lot of upcycling. Uh, so we take in a lot of the garbage from around this little community in the jungle. And then we try to build our stuff that we're making for scientists out of garbage as much as much as possible um a because uh it's hard to get stuff all the way out here and b because then we can kind of dick around more <laughs> and uh and you know mess around with stuff because you know we're just playing with garbage uh, the two main things that we do at our lab uh, now is we kind of help animal rescues and we help field biologists. So like uh, we do a thing called enrichment for animals that aren't allowed to live in the wild uh, because They'll, they're injured, uh, they're being rehabilitated, uh, they're unable to take care of themselves. Um, this was a sun bear maze uh, where uh, my students in Singapore helped me make this. Uh, it would, it's pretty fun. It, uh, it would detect the sun bear's long tongue and then squirt honey into a tube where the sun bear wasn't licking. Uh, so it had to keep like searching around. It's a, it's a pretty fun thing. A lot of these animals need, you know, constant stimulation or else it's bad for their, their like mental health. Uh, this is our tapir that uh, we live next to. Uh, <laughs> and we develop different toys uh, to help keep her occupied um, and have a good time. Uh, here's another uh, little tippy toy where she has to use her fun snoot to figure out how to solve this food maze. Uh, <laughs> um, and but we also work with field biologists. We do like design, consulting, program stuff, experiment with new types of field biology tools like um, um camera traps that see in all dimensions so you can see uh, are in three dimension are 360 degrees uh so you can see not just the agouti in front of you but the agoutis behind you um we've somewhat unfortunately had to take on the role of a of what a large uh field biology or uh, institution used to do and that was just completely abandoned their own scientists such as like taking care of their field sites um doing community things like public spanish and english classes um uh, but we also offer like long and short-term residencies we've helped host field courses um and we also try to build mobile maker spaces like this is the boat lab in the philippines uh, we do hiking hacks, uh, where we walk around in the forest with the field biologists and build stuff kind of in the wild. But today, the main thing that we're talking about uh, is Dynacon. And so um, this all came about because of something you all are probably much more familiar with um, if you bumped against academia. Um, and then we're like, ew, gross. Why uh, do academic academics do this thing where they pay all this money and put all this time and effort into this for-profit companies that um, basically lock away all your information as, after you give them to them. And for people who are in a lot of technological fields, conferences and journal publications are joined together, like people in HCI and computer stuff. So not only do you have to um, get your paper published, but in order to get your paper published, you actually have to go to this conference and present your paper or else they won't publish your paper in the proceedings. And so that means you have to give more money to this uh, publishing group like the ACM um, and not only money to them, but money to these big hotel industrial conferences 
complexes. Um, so you have to give a bunch of money to the Hyatt in Hong Kong or whatever. Um, and it just kind of sucks. Uh, and so, yeah, like you, you get all these people, all these resources, gather them together. You tend to go inside to a boring, nondescript place that looks just like every other hotel you've ever been to, right? Um, you don't really explore the local context much. And usually it's quite rushed. People are there for two or three days. Um, and they spend the whole time preparing their presentation while ignoring the presentations in front of them so that they can go and then present their presentations to a bunch of people ignoring them. It's a great system, right? And so anyway, uh, I got pretty sick of that. And in kind of my classic way, I'm like, well, I'm just going to have my own conference. <laughs> and so um, I look to a lot of other great groups that I've seen who've done awesome, fun things like uh, Gosh and General. Um, and uh, uh, there's this awesome, there's this cool thing that Liz uh, Gosh and Public Lab just showed me recently, openspaceworld.org. Has anybody heard of this? It was this, this kind of like fun hippie group uh, that Liz was saying like a lot of Public Lab ethos built upon. And it was all about how do you collect people and try to have all of their like voices heard and like feel out the goals of, of the, the group of people that you're with. Um, so it's pretty cool. Check out openspaceworld.org. Um, and so for the very first Dynacon, um, I was grumpy in my academic job as a professor in Singapore. And I was like, screw this, I'm not getting tenure anyway. Um, so in instead of doing the minimum requirements where I have to publish two to three papers at a conference, I'm gonna take the resources that would have gone into that um, and just uh, put on my own conference. Um, and so we had the very first Dynacon. Uh, the basics of any of the Dynacons, we have about 100 people uh, from all around the world, and we try to get them to live and work together in a kind of semi-remote location. Um, it's not necessarily like some of the hiking hacks, we're going like maybe deeper into a field biologist site, and it's maybe not as accessible to everybody. Um, but this it's like we try to offer a gradient where people can go as deep into jungly fun stuff as they want or you know they could be in a nice cabana on the beach uh, kind of thing but either way proximity to interesting nature and wildlife um, and it's an extended period of time so they've all been about four to six weeks long uh, we actually spent two months doing the very first Dynacon and the entire goal is very generic. Um, it's just about interacting with nature um, in some kind of fun way. So these are, this is like, for instance, our, our, our buddy, Michael Candy, um, just whipped together this fun tree climbing robot because he was talking with some camera trap people and they were talking about how it's hard to get a camera up in the canopy. Um, and so he made this little robot that can kind of stick to a tree and just climb all the way up. And then you can look around uh, and see what's up there. And so it was about getting these different people together to share these ideas. And then, of course, to share all these ideas back out to the rest of the world. So everything that we do gets put together in a little compendium, uh, our little proceedings to sound really fancy. Um, so we publish our proceedings every year and then uh, we share them freely. So they're all freely available on archive.org. Um, and, and then also the PDFs, I think I also just host on dynalab.net. Um, and you can also pub, uh, print them for the cost of them being printed. Uh, there's only three basic rules of Dynacon. Sorry, I'm just doing a quick time check for myself. Okay. And uh, you first, everyone who goes to Dynacon has to make something. Uh, two, you have to document it and share it openly. And then three, you need to get it reviewed by at least two other people who were there. Um, and so with that, we try to like take the kind of like good pieces about, you know, what the kind of academic peer review process is supposed to be about sharing ideas and then helping each other sculpt and refine these ideas in interesting ways and then sharing them back out again. Uh, so we've had Dynacon in Thailand, Dynacon in Panama. Um, uh, both of those, uh, the other key things about Dynacon is we tried to each time, instead of just giving a bunch of money to a big hotel, uh, that just then that money just vaporizes. Uh, we try to help this money work with local groups. So the very first Dynacon in Thailand, 
we worked with Tasneem and Yannick, who had this boat that we were trying to turn into like a floating maker space, uh, which was super cool. And then uh, the Dynacon in Panama, we helped kind of inaugurate my lab here and start trying to like organize it here, as well work with this group called Adopta Bosque um, that uh, works in the Darien region to do reforestation. Um, they were super cool to work with. And then uh, for our very most recent Dynacon, we worked with, uh, in Batikaloa, Sri Lanka, we worked with the fantastic folks at Dream Space Academy. Um, and these folks were just so super great. Um, it was a really amazing, cool experience to work with. We were in Sri Lanka, um, a quick warning, uh, just like a brief primer on like Sri Lanka from someone who I am not saying I'm an expert in this in any way. Uh, it's very complex, uh, but uh, they've had uh, 30 years of civil war um, up till about 2009, where in very boiled down way uh, over in the West uh, was fighting against the East and the North. Uh, the Sinhalese versus the Tamil people. Um, and it really left, especially the, the area that we were in, uh, totally devastated. Um, there was just uh, mass killings. Uh, everyone that you know uh, has had an immediate family member um, who's, who's been horribly uh, killed and stuff like that. And uh, that was really tragic. They had a huge um, tsunami that uh, totally wiped out and obliterated this area we're in uh, called Batikaloa. As you can see, there's an ocean over on the left side of the screen, and then it's very narrow peninsula, and there's a really cool, fascinating uh, lagoon on the right side of, this, of the screen. Um, and so it's a really fascinating area, but it's just now people are actually starting to move back in there to live and to like kind of rebuild. And one of the main groups uh, working there is this cool group called Dream Space Academy. Um, and this was set up by Arvind uh, originally, um, who had to flee when he was a child from the, the Civil War, and then is coming back to try to set up resources for the locals to explore like technology and art and design and, and just basically make interesting resources for the people uh, who live there. So they were a really cool, uh, fascinating group to work with. This is one of the main facilities we were in. Uh, this used to be a, uh, a like nun's house, uh, like a Catholic place where they store nuns, I guess, a nun or whatever the word for that is. Um, and, but it's now we help turn it into a big, cool lab. So they have electronics labs, software labs, bio labs, story labs, space labs. Um, and so me on the Dynacon side, we had me, Lee, and Sid have been preparing uh, for the past two years uh, after Dream Space reached out to us uh, and invited us to try to collaborate for a Dynacon there. Um, and uh, we, uh, we decided, hey, let's do it. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these things, uh, like if you've been to a gosh, if you've been to like a PIF camp or something like that, we do the kind of uh, fun, unconference style. Uh, everybody who's there gets to make up uh, how we do the, the scheduling and, and build it all together. Um, and then every Saturday, so during the weeks, we have uh, uh, everybody builds and makes their own schedule. And then every Saturday is an open day where the community is invited and we do kind of exhibitions and demo days. Um, and and uh, we also, in, uh, uh, inspired by Public Lab, uh, we did a weekly newsletter at Public Lab at their barn raisings has a newsletter, and we would publish a fun newsletter. Uh, we have a fun code of conduct inspired by uh, Gosh, very similar. Everything's open source. The goal is to create abundance, not scarcity. Um, and all the science is, is open. I'm just gonna very quickly show you a couple fun projects and then I'll be done. Uh, so like uh, similar to here, importing resources can be difficult even for things like when you're at a, a Western rich maker space and you're like, yeah, let's laser cut. Here's a big sheet of acrylic. I don't need to cut a circle out of the middle. Okay, throw the rest away, right? Um, but uh, those big nice sheets of acrylic can be hard to come by. So people like Paul Latte uh, are making nice acrylic recyclers and other plastic recyclers. This is Palm who is doing some more uh, plastic recycling crafts. And we were turning uh, PET bottles um, into new 3D printer filament. And that was working great. We're building another one here in Panama now. Um, super awesome. 
zine workshops, uh, swimming classes. Uh, this was actually one of our most important uh, uh, workshops we did. Camera trapping classes um, and exploring all the wildlife around us um, all kinds of other fun projects that you can find out more about in the, here's a mushroom made out of mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> all kinds of fun projects you can uh, check out uh, when we get our proceedings together, hopefully by the beginning of October. Our deadline is the gosh gathering at the end of October uh, that uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to have the books ready for people to check out everything that we made. And yeah, so I'll just turn it over if I have uh, tiny, I think I have five minutes ish left um, and I can answer any questions. I want to make sure if there's any questions. Uh, yeah. And if not, while people are maybe thinking of questions, I'm just going to show more random things. This is our friend Daphne, uh, who's a big crocodile who would go around in the uh, in the lagoon. And uh, so one of the interesting things uh, that we came across was despite this area being flanked on both sides by water, because of the Civil War, the military had occupied this place for about 30 years and nobody was allowed to swim. And it's basically like stopped like two generations of people like swimming. And so nobody swims here. And so that's why uh, the swimming classes were actually one of the most uh, important workshops that we've gotten like tons of feedback on and that like uh, teaching some like very basic like swim classes um, really opened up whole new worlds of, of exploration, especially because this area Batikloa is known for this thing that for centuries has been called the singing fish and it's part of the culture there um but all the locals um uh in general so shanjavan uh, who's head of the ocean lab there was telling me that like everyone in batikaloa they're like oh yeah we're the land of the singing fish it's not a real thing it's just like a cute little mythological thing that at, when there's a full moon uh the fish in the lagoon starts singing but if you just go in the water on a full moon, uh, you can just totally hear them. It's very loud. Uh, so and uh, and so it wasn't until like the 60s uh, that there was a, a like a priest who dropped a microphone in the water and was like, hey, I recorded these singing fish. They're like pretty real. And then some other like Western scientists came and did a little bit of studying in the early 2000s. Um, but they're largely uh, not that studied. And so we're working with the, the Dream Space Lab, the Ocean Lab, and deploying some audio moths. Uh, so here's a little audio moth uh, on this boat that we made. So we built uh, this, I got a grant, and we used all the money to build a big floating maker space out in the water uh, that is now going to be observing these singing fish. And it even has fun LEDs on it that change colors when uh, the singing fish starts singing. So you can have, you don't even have to go in the water to be like, hey, the singing fish are singing, cool. 